Hi, Alicia. Hi, Hi. Kashina. Going to announce that we are officially recording okay. as of now. Okay. And I have a meeting that I have to start at 6.30, um, and Paul Donna Ray will sit in for me until our meeting is over. Okay. At the HRC. Right. And then I have a council meeting at 6.30 I'm going to jump to. Okay. We will do our best to keep things moving along. Great. Thank you. So we're ready to start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, um, working group members. Good evening, uh, those of you who are participating and viewing from outside of this meeting. Uh, welcome to the Community Safety Working Group's weekly meeting. And uh, it appears we have a quorum. So I would like to uh, take a roll call right now. If you would just acknowledge by saying your name and present, I would appreciate it. Uh, let's see, Ms. Walker. Here. Okay. Get my full screen here, thank you. Um, Ms. Owen. Here. Ms. Ferreira. Here. Thank you, and I'm here as well. Good evening, everyone, again. Thank you. Oh, oh, you have Russ. I'm, I'm here too. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi, Russ. I'm well, here too. And now, I, and Tashina, I believe, I don't know if I called your name, I didn't see her on screen there. And Tashina Bowen? Yeah. Yes, you're here. Thank you everyone for being here and uh, getting the meeting started. Uh, uh, we are at uh, 531 uh, to start our meeting and uh, going to uh, take a quick review of the agenda uh, for tonight and then we'll move to the uh, approval of the uh, last meeting's minutes. Uh, this evening, we're continuing in, in our our work to um, try to get as close to our community and in most the closest connection we can to our community uh, for the purpose of creating what we feel will be an important uh, piece of work that will contribute to the ongoing uh, safety and health of our community as a whole. And um, this evening, after we approve the minutes, we're going to be uh, opening up for public comment. Uh, we welcome those of you who are uh, in the audience today to uh, feel free to make a comment to us as a group. As I've said before, we will listen respectfully to you. Uh, this would be not a time that we'd be engaging in conversation, but we will um, hear everything you have to say. I also want to remind the community too that we try to limit that to about 15 minutes for the sake of the work that the community, uh, community, the uh, working group has to do. So we'd appreciate anything you can do to contribute to that. Um, after public comment, uh, I usually open it up to the uh, working group itself to see if there are any announcements from the members of uh, personal work they've been doing um, between meetings any uh, updates from uh, their experiences that they feel might contribute to the work of the, of the group. And then we'll get into our, our action and discussion items, which is to uh, first up, uh, bring together an update through a discussion about the community outreach planning and next action steps we're, we're doing. This will be most likely a bulk of what our conversation will be about tonight since uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in between meetings to begin to work on questions and outreach strategies. Um, you will hear about that. We'll discuss that in, in full this evening. We will also take a look at the, uh, the League of Women Voters um, research that they've done and the study that they've uh, shared with us. There's some important features to that that may inform the, our, you know, our work as a committee. 
And uh, and then uh, in our uh, in our agenda is an update on the police bill. It this is not necessarily a, a formal piece of what we're doing, but it is a uh, an overlay of what's happening in the state with respect to uh, policing in general and police policies and procedures. And I would just like to open that up to our group to discuss any thoughts they may have about that and um, consider you know, how we might wanna work in line with some of the things that are coming out of the, uh, the state, state bill. And lastly, um, we, um, we're going to discuss the support and resources needed by our group to continue our work. We are in the process of sharing this information broadly, whether it's readings, uh, webinars, um, art articles of any kind, books, etc. And uh, we feel that this is going to be an important piece of our work uh, going forward. So again, this will be a time for us to articulate what we're doing with respect okay. to respect to resources. Sorry about that phone ringing. So let me go back and uh, uh, welcome um, everyone once again and ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, December 9th Community Safety Working Group. Paul, do you want to take revisions of the minutes after the motion's made or before? Uh, I think after the motion, if that's okay. Sure. In so fact, I'll move, we, could, I'll move fact we could, Russ, we could actually, if it sounds like you have some. I do. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we do that then? Let's, let's do that. And then it'll make an easier path toward um, All right. uh, approval. Well, first of all, I wanted to say, I realize that Jennifer has been taking minutes and screen sharing all at the same time. And Jennifer, I don't know how you do both of those and participate in the meeting, <laughs> but that's quite a challenge. Uh, two, let's see, two things I noticed. Uh, one was in number two, um, letter B, where I updated the group about the, the workshop. I think the last, two words there should be mental illness rather than mental abuse. Okay. And then on the section 3B uh, where it says Mrs. Pat will create questions for question three. I think what Mrs. Pat actually asked was whether I would take what everybody had submitted and try to merge them into a, a, a set of questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. And any other um, edits, corrections to last week's minutes? For those of you who don't know for the latter part of the meeting I was not in attendance but um, the meeting did continue um, I believe I left a little after 6 30 so um, any other comments well I wanted to ask Jennifer in the future if we see things would you rather we sent them to you right away or wait until the meeting No, we can do it this way. I mean, that way everybody's aware because if, if you send, if I send them out and then you make a change, then I have to send them back out to the group again. Okay, okay. yeah. And I, I mean, unless it's something just really no, no, outrageous, not, but- um, We don't, we don't need to add a step. I, I, that's <laughs> what I was asking. Whatever's easiest yeah. for you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go forward, I wanna, I wanna welcome uh, Ms. Pat. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, if there are no further comments on the minutes of last week, I will now welcome a motion to accept, accept the minutes for approval. So move. 
So it's been moved. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as amended. I'll take a roll call. Ms. Ferreira. Aye. Ms. Walker. Aye. Ms. Owen. Aye. Ms. Anoni Baku. Aye. Ms. Bowman. Aye. Okay, the, the motion is passed. The minutes have been approved. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get the vote, Paul. I did not say your Paul, name. No, I also support, approve the vote. Uh, support. I, I, I was trying to purposely leave you the over motion. there, Russ. <laughs> I have a Sorry. question. I forgot, Mr. I forgot you, Russ. I apologize, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I have a question. Yes, Ms. Pat. So Ms. Bowen wasn't here uh, last week. That's correct. So does it get to, I don't know, how does it work? She can abstain. Yeah. You could, she can vote too. Oh, she can vote too. Yeah. You can always vote. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a full complement of everyone responding right now. Okay. So like the motion to approve the minutes has been passed. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move right to uh, public comment. If there are any of you who are joining us and participating this evening would like to comment, um, please acknowledge yourself and um, Ms. Moyston will, uh, will recognize you. So I don't see anyone's hands up at the moment. No one, okay. Thank you, not seeing um, anyone who wants to make a comment, uh, you know, we will move forward. Again, thank you for attending. Let me turn it over to our, our, our group as a whole. Since last week, um, we are all in, involved in different things and thinking about this work together and just like to open it up to see if there are any thoughts or uh, or comments you want to make uh, about this work in your your personal life that you're bringing to the table, and uh, you know if you're willing to share that with our with our our group and our public. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, this was one of my, part of, partly in following on one of my assignments from the group, which was to find out about Newton. Uh, I went to the uh, public hearing and meeting that the Newton Police Reform Task Force had uh, the other night. Uh, Paul Bachelman was there too. And Paul, you may have some comments on this as well. Um, it was a really interesting event. They had 72 people there uh, they did not use the Zoom webinar format. They used the Zoom meeting format and they had the chat open. Uh, and it was a very interesting dialogue in the chat with, I mean, some people spoke to the group, but a, a lot of people just put things in the chat and there were some back and forth. And then the consultants recognized, you know, brought to the fore some things that were in the chat. <clears throat> um, but they're doing four town halls, two in December and two in January. Um, they have a February 1st deadline for their report. Um, and the four are focused on where are we now? What, where do we want to go? How will we get there? And how will we ensure success? Uh, which I thought was an interesting way to think about uh, the work. Um, and, you know, they're paying a consultant, whatever it is, a hundred and some thousand dollars um, and the consultants ran the meeting and reported out a little bit of what they'd found of what they called SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, about the Newton police force. One of the things that they reported was that the violent crime rate in Newton is six 
per 10,000 citizens. Uh, and that the statewide rate is 36 per 10,000 citizens, or 10,000 residents. Um, and I realize I'd like to propose we add to our list of questions for the police department, you know, what's, what's the rate uh, in Amherst. Um, they had a very interesting discussion about the police contract uh, and whether or not they're, they're actually negotiating a contract and hiring a new police chief all at the same time they have their reform committee going. Um, but uh, there was a lot of talk about whether the contract was likely to inhibit the implementation of reforms that the group came up with and how their work could have input into the contract. Um, and some of their committee has done some work studying their police contract and it occurred to me that might be one of the things some of us might want to do. There was also a discussion about, I mean, they have a very active defund the police group um, and about whether that terminology was problematic and how well, how much you had to involve the police to force in order to have any expectation that the recommendations would actually be adopted. I think their situation is a little different than ours, but um, it was just uh, quite fascinating to see another community uh, really in dialogue about some of the same issues um, and to see, um, you know, with, with good meeting leadership, how, um, how it was possible to have a community dialogue. Their consultant did say at one point, quote, our entire society is built on structures that are fundamentally racist and there are no exceptions. Um, and they were very careful not to be very critical of the police department, but also to identify the police department as not being an exception to the fact that the racism of the society shows up. Um, and then the police chief spoke at the very end and commented that you know, in big cities, crime fighting is about 20% of what the police do. In Newton, it's about 10% of what the police do. Um, and as he described it, um, he said that the police department is primarily a service organization and that that's most of what they do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, just reporting. I don't know, Paul Bachelman, did you wanna comment about the meeting? You're muted right now. I, actually, I was in and out, so I didn't hear as much as you did, Russ. So I don't have anything else to add to what you what you noted. But it is, it, you know, I find I do find it instructional to hear what other communities are the the conversations the other communities are having as well. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, having it be an active committee like a, using Zoom meeting. So the town, our town, has not done that, and that's a different conversation. Um, primarily because we have been Zoom bombed several times with um, uh, committees have, and that's a, it's a very, um, it's, you should have a very careful conversation about that because um, we don't support something outside the, the webinar format because we have had meetings where racist and vile and pornographic images and comments have been, been spewed in, in these public meetings. So. We have really tried to lock down the on the webinar format, but again, that's a, when you get to the more public thing where it's not a formal committee meeting. Uh, I just don't want to put anybody in a situation where they're going to be vulnerable to that. So, but I, but Zoom is the, the way we do it is so constrained, and I know that's a frustration for you. So we can talk about what the other with IT, what other options are available for that. Yeah, when we get to the hearing in particular, yeah. uh, I think it'd be great if we could use the meeting format. Zoom has done a great deal to improve uh, its capability for defending against uh, Zoom bombing. And I've, I've been studying that and um, I think there's a lot, I think we can pretty much guarantee that Zoom bombing can be contained if we, if we set it up the right way. Yeah, it just has to be managed, I agree. But, but again, I do think it's always interesting to see how other communities going through a similar process. Not It's never to directly comparable. Um, no. And Newton isn't comparable to Amherst at all, but some of the dialogue is similar. <laughs> right. I actually have a question. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Bowman. I would like to know, or one of the questions that I think that 
is um, important is, you know, <clears throat> when we're looking at um, Amherst po Police Department and their community outreach, or I don't know how it's, however it's put down, put, um, I'd like to have more detail as to what they're doing outside of crime fighting, basically the question I have. I will, that's, that's the question that comes to mind is like, because one of the things that I see is, um, you know, them out there directing traffic because the, you know, the power lines and whatnot are, you know, being taken care of. And as a community member, yeah, that's really good, but I don't really see that as community like engagement. So I would like to know, I would like to have a better idea. Can you be careful with that hot pan, please? I mean, that hot bowl. Um, I would like to have more of an idea of what what they're doing that they consider um, community outreach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if I may, uh, in response both to um, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and, and Ms. Bowman, uh, first, uh, Mr. J Mr. Vernon Jones's comment, I think is, is an important discussion topic for us going forward in terms of how to protect ourselves from the, 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 the kinds of uh, threats, if you will, that uh, Mr. Bachelman is pointing out that may come into the arena of our discussions, how best to do that, especially since we're trying to broaden and, uh, and deepen our conversation opportunities with the community. So, um, you know, whether it's Zoom or whether it's some other format, I think as this begins to uh, get our work begins to get some traction in the community, I assume we're going to attract a, a larger um, group of people. We're certainly going to have uh, a, a broader uh, array of opinions. So for us as a group thinking about how to best manage that and how to do it, because we have talked about already the possibility of, uh, you know, holding events that are open to the public. So while we haven't really defined that thoroughly, um, I think that's just an important feature of our work we have to consider if, in fact, we are committed to reaching out to the community as a whole. In response to Ms. Bowman's uh, comment, uh, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and myself um, are in, involved in creating the questions and the follow-up for this. And, you know, if it doesn't already, if it doesn't already reside in that set of questions that we're doing, uh, I, I think it may as I'm listening to the question, but we'll be assured that um, we add that to our repertoire and make sure we, we include it and I appreciate the, the offering. Other comments from folks? Let's see here. Brianna has her hand up, Paul. Yeah, I'm just changing my screen here. Yeah. Thank you, Russ. Ms. Owen. Um, so I just wanted to add kind of off of what Russ was saying and talk a little bit about um, what Salem was doing, because I know we did all um, assign ourselves a different town to look into what they're doing for police reform. So I did do a little bit of research to see what Salem Mass was doing for police reform. And um, the mayor has openly took a stand against systemic racism <clears throat> and to combat police reform they have created a 26 member race equity task force um, their goal is to thoroughly review city policies services and community systems they are interested in um, intersecting systems such as education health care employment but the first thing that they're looking to reform is um, the law enforcement in salem um, i wasn't able to find the structure of their meetings, um, their minutes and that type of thing. But I did email to inquire about it. And um, part of what they're working toward with their police reform is potentially making a civilian review board to um, cement long-term racial equity in law enforcement there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others, I mean, I see from the notes yeah. we have other folks who have, uh, let me see. So I yes, have Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I have something too. So yeah, along the same lines, 
um, you know, I have to look at Northampton, but just a quick thing in terms of the youth, which I do want to hear if there's um, been any movement. I know you all can't tell us if anyone, who, who are the people who have applied, but I just want to know if there's any movement in terms of like young people applying um, for the committee. That's one of the things. Just so you all know, my son has decided not to apply. Um, he just has too much going on, but he's still spreading the word um, to other young people so that they can apply in the high school. Um, so I wanted to give an update on that. Um, but for me, I was to look at into Northampton and uh, what they've been doing around police reform. So I've done a little bit too, I haven't done too much, but a little bit. And, um, you know, one of the first things that they did was uh, when all of the uh, protests were, go were going on around, um, you know, June was that they already did decrease their budget by 10%. Um, f within the police department. So that meant a $669,907 uh, budget decrease, um, which their chief um, for the police officer, chief wasn't very happy about. Uh, her name is Chief Jody Casper, because she said that that would mean that there would be some loss of police officers. Um, but they were concerned about the fact that um, that their, their money could go into other um, areas and also the fact that police don't have to respond to kind of issues that deal with mental health, addiction, homelessness. And they were saying that one of the things that could change would be that mental health services or drug counselors could respond to those types of incidents as opposed to having the police do that. Um, it was interesting though too that I thought that the chief um, Casper from Northampton when they were the budget cuts happened um, that the first thing that she said in terms of uh, police officers being lost, and she brought up the fact that there were going to be these three candidates that were uh, uh, BIPOC that were going to be um, graduating from the police academy and saying that that would be the reason that, um, you know, that this budget cut would not entail, allow them to be hired. So it was interesting that that was the only time she kind of brought, brought this up in this article that I was reading. Um, and for me, I mean, I, 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 it, it didn't seem very genuine. It seemed disingenuous to kind of bring it up at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the other thing too is in the same article, it said that Boston also did the same thing. They uh, decreased their police department budget by, by uh, uh, 20%, so $12 million, and that they're going to be spreading it out to um, other uh, youth programs, community youth programs um, to, to also address homelessness and other um, areas like housing, healthcare, you know, that are impact fo of folks uh, inequ inequitably. Um, and the police commissioner though of Boston, he was on, on, on point with the mayor in terms of having this cut. He thought that this is something that needed to happen because he felt that it, it that the police shouldn't shouldn't be involved in all the, the kind of mental health cases and things like that. So he was in agreement with it. So in terms of Northampton though, going back to Northampton, uh, what they've done is uh, they put together a, a commission too. So Northampton Policy Review Commission, um, they held their first public meeting on December 1st. And there's actually a Zoom link, but I didn't have a chance to kind of, cause I guess you can even, they recorded it. So you can even look at it now, what the public meeting was, but I didn't have a chance to do that. Um, and so what they're tasked to do is that they're gonna be examining the department's budget, the use of force policies, and then also alternatives to uh, current policing practices. Um, they have a 15 member uh, commission they have to do a report by mid-March of 2021, of this next year. They did start their work though back in September um, and they have these uh, three subcommittees too, which is policing policies and services. That's one subcommittee, um, spending and contracts. So this is all dealing with the police and then alternatives to policing. Um, so as a whole, they've met around um, 12 times um, so far. Mm -hmm. So that was the information. Oh, and one other thing uh, in terms of um, the, the police chief from North Ham Northampton, you know, Jody Casper, she did say, because I guess once they did do the budget, she did do an update in another article. And she basically said that once um, they, they cut their budget by 10%, um, I guess some police officers, once that happened, I guess about 11 police officers 
uh, decided to apply to other places and then five of them left um, because they wanted to leave the department because they felt the department you know wasn't being supportive of, of them um, so just to kind of let you all know what what transpired after the budget cut thank you thank you very much uh, miss Ferreira <clears throat> And I, I'll be I'll be trying to do uh, I'll try to email them to get more information though. Mm -hmm. I, I think you uh, you misrepresented yourself in some way by saying that you didn't do much work on that <laughs> at the start of your comments. I appreciate your the extra time you put in, you know, for our community in in, in doing this work. And um, if uh, if the group may allow me, I'd like to just say something about Newark. Um, and um, I was charged with looking at Newark. And uh, so I, I began some of that work and I, there's still more to do, but uh, certainly, you know, all of you know, from a historical perspective, you know, Newark, New Jersey was at the heart of, of unrest in the sixties. And uh, a lot of was going on uh, politically and socially and economically for the, the community. In fact, I was recalling conversations I had with a good uh, college colleague of mine, colleague and friend of mine who lived in East Orange nearby and um, how volatile that situation was. And, you know, sort of fast forwarding, and this doesn't follow any particular linear pattern, but uh, ultimately, the um, uh, the Justice Department moved in, and they're operating under a, a consent de de decree, a consent decree, and um, to basically, you know, it, it's a settlement, you know, for them to take action in particular ways that are very uh, explicit and very discreet uh, and very concrete. And they're in the process of, of doing that. The um, Ras Baraka, the mayor, um, I saw was quoted as saying, you know, it's a new day in New Jersey, uh, you know, in Newark, New Jersey for this kind of work because they're really doing a lot more now to get engaged in community. And while that's happening, uh, we have to know like other places, you know, it's, it's not a perfect science going forward. There is still, uh, you know, like in many other communities, a lot of mistrust um, in the community uh, of the police uh, because of the historical context, certainly. But there's a lot also going on. And just to, you know, my initial work in there was to look at um, the um, what they have as a consent, de excuse me, a consent decree and planning division, which came out of the, the work with the Department of Justice. And this particular uh, division has a number of, of, of sub divisions to it, if you will. One of them that caught my attention was community engagement. And uh, they generate uh, reports. They have uh, a thing called community and cops. And if you can just sort of visualize the word community, it's capital C-O-M-M, -M, and then unity is all in caps. And cops is all in caps. So unity and cops. And there are programs under these subheadings. And uh, they have community service officers and they also have school resource officers. Now, as someone mentioned earlier, I, I guess, you know, it was another city. We're, we're not the same in terms of cities and towns and in terms of our contextual experiences. But um, this is just to say, like, they're, they're ex examining different strategies and tactics for how to, you know, how to deal with the issue of policing in their communities. And there's, there's a lot that's, that still has to be done. So I, I plan to look into that more, more deeply uh, since this was... Actually, this assignment was given to me while I was absent from the meeting. So you all snuck that in on me. That was, but I caught you. <laughs> anyway, this is all, all good work. And I did wanna say that, you know, Newark also has a, a civilian oversight agency. And that title is important because I think this is where a lot of the, uh, 
the, the head banging, the, the, the buttressing comes from, you know, the police versus the community. Who has oversight? Who should have oversight? And I think this is where, you know, police and the community interact in ways where they dispute on who has the authority or a realm of oversight that's most important. So I see that as a conversation more than a, a, than a dispute. But certainly in Amherst, it, you know, we talked about how the community could get more involved in policing and how to interact more with police. So there are probably some ideas and models and strategies out there that we can take advantage of going forward. But um, just wanted to mention that uh, about Newark. There's much more to be learned about them, certainly, and I will uh, uh, certainly follow up. I think there were others who had... Um, you know, other communities they were looking into, if you are able and willing to report on those, now I'd appreciate it. Um, I'm raising Pat. my hand. Ms. Pat. Okay, so um, nobody snuck anything on you. Actually, I thought I was supposed to do the no work and also Somerville, but you did a great job and thank God you, you know, you decided to look into no work. What I like about new work is the level of community engagement and the civilian oversight in that city, even though it's not the same as Amherst community. So I looked into Somerville, where our town manager is from, and I, I am pleasantly surprised um, when I looked into the website, like I typically do when I go to any website, I'm looking at it from the lens of a black woman, you know, what is this city or town is all about? And they have already diversity catalog, um, basically for they list all the businesses owned by people of color, by um, LGBT um, individuals, uh, immigrants, um, veterans, uh, uh, disabled business owners, so I was kind of intrigued. I also noticed on the website that they have a multicultural affairs department. Wow. And basically that department is supposed to be addressing issues of racism to make sure that their residents have um, equal treatment like in the rest of the uh, uh, residents there. So I was kind of uh, impressed with that. They also have Office of um, Immigrant Affairs. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. That's something we can learn, uh, Ahmed can learn from the city of Somerville. Then I started uh, the real assignment. And uh, in June of this year, the city declared, uh, declared um, racism as a public safety and health emergency. The mayor um, announced 10 point plan to address racism. And one of, uh, there were 10 of them, but one of the points that really caught my eye is the independent civilian oversight. Um, I kind of like that. Um, similar to, I think, why my, um, my attention also you know, caught with uh, Newark too. Um, the mayor also is committed to um, the hashtag eight can't wait campaign. Do people know what that is? I don't wanna, do people know what that is? It's basically a, a project by Campaign Zero to address use of force in policing. So um, I believe the, some of the police agreed to addressing uh, use of police uh, force in the work they do. And, and I think significantly is that um, the city is, uh, has created a new racial and social justice initiative. And one of the things that they plan to do is to hire a new director of uh, racial and social justice. Um, they, ad they advertise the position online. And the only thing I don't like about the new initiative is that the new director will be reporting to the mayor. 
I had hoped that it would be independent, but that's, you know, that's why as I can go, since they haven't hired the director, I don't even know who to contact, but I'm very impressed with the work that the mayor is doing in the city. And it seems like the interim acting police chief um, has worked at Somerville before, left and came back because the chief police retire, is retired or something like that. Am I correct, Mr. Buckman? Yeah, retired. So I think a lot of good things is happening in Somerville. I actually have some friends who are familiar with Somerville City. And um, so I think there are a few things we can learn from, from them. I'm hoping to continue uh, doing additional research, um, at least talk to the mayor. I don't know when they're going to hire their social justice director. Um, I didn't see much about um, community engagement. I tried to dig in and research, um, but I didn't talk to anybody yet, but I hope to do that in the future. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Uh -oh. Hello. I was just okay. trying to unmute myself here. My 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 screen froze on my end. Oh no. <laughs> uh, I'm okay now. I'm back. Um, I was saying I want to thank you for your 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 work and and your research as well as others who've reported. Uh, are there any others, um, Ms. Walker? Thank you. Um, yep, so I was assigned to do Cambridge, um, and mine is still a work in progress, but what I have so far is um, in Cambridge, they have a similar group to what we are doing here. They have created a public safety committee, um, and they hold public hearings similar to these. Um, they have assigned a topic for each meeting, and they have done things like review police policies, specifically the use of force policy. Um, they've e done evaluations of their surveillance ordinance um, and they review annual reports that the police produce. Um, and so they have also committed to as a city to invest in public safety by co-designing and power sharing with the community. And how they do that is they have groups who are, who they described as um, representing residents who have been historically marginalized and unheard in government and safety planning. Um, and so they actually fund, they partially fund these groups to do the work to work within the communities and report back to their group. Um, and those groups include the Cambridge Families of Color Coalition, the Cambridge Educators of Color Coalition, My Brothers and My Sisters Keepers, Special Education Advisory Council and Black Yard Arts. Um, I haven't gotten into exactly how those groups are directly involved in the decision making, but I did see that they were discussing things like um, anti-racist hiring policies and reallocating funds. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Thank you. All of you are continuing to do great work and appreciate your efforts. Um, I, again, for, for all of us, just reminding us of how this, as we're taking this in, you know, we're taking notes from each meeting that we're constantly focused on, you know, what, 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 what our mission is as, as a, a working group. And, and I, I see this information as informing and, and giving a backdrop to our work here in Amherst. Even though we're outreaching to different communities, we're looking at, at research from different places, certainly uh, some very large pieces of research about policing, et cetera, that uh, we, we, we're working to funnel this down to where it has meaning and impact um, for our own community. And, uh, you know, we're gonna move into talking about uh, you know our, our next step planning based on the, the, the other work that we had to do in terms of raising questions, et cetera, for next steps. But I do want to take a moment to just say that um, 
I'm going all the way back to a first conversation we had as a working group that there still exists, unfortunately, a lot of mistrust, um, distrust, mistrust, however you want to put it. There's a, a lack of faith in policing in general, especially among black and brown and poor communities. And so knowing that, um, I, I hope we also keep in mind that while we're collecting data, which is important and informs our decisions, that we're also collecting data that will help inform how we can better uh, position ourselves to build relationships when this, in this community. None of this works. None of this will work unless we're on, on the path toward building better relationships within the community with our, our police department. And that's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of different pathways to get there. And it, it's not necessarily gonna be smooth all the time, but that's one of the things that I wanted to say. In addition, uh, before going to the next piece, I, I wanna encourage us also to think about what's underneath some of the things that we're hearing and seeing. You know, when we hear about, you know, things such as, um, I, I, I heard this statistic in, in uh, read about the statistic in Newark, where uh, use of force against black people was 2.7 times higher than white people. But what does that mean underneath that? You know, what are the questions we want that are driving the discussion underneath that? It's, it's good to know the statistic and it's horrific in its presence. But what, what does that mean in terms of our work here? Because even though it's Newark, the essence of it is in Amherst in terms of how people feel. So I just, just keep us going deeper into finding root causes about this and that will inform what we're doing. And um, again, I, I can't stress enough the relationships piece because it seems like that's where we're gonna find our best success in Amherst. I, I think we're, we're poised to do that uh, by asking all the hard questions and doing all the hard work that we're doing. So, I, and I think there's a readiness in Amherst to do that at this particular time. So I will, I'll stop talking there for a minute. And, uh, you know, with your permission, I'd like to move on to the, uh, uh, the piece of our agenda where we're talking about updating uh, a community outreach planning and next actions. Um, all of us have submitted questions. We have a framework for how to, to do this. I, I think we're poised to make some next steps and uh, whether it's with the police department, you know, most directly, whether it's community agencies um, as they exist in our community or individuals. So I wanna just open that up to uh, this group to have a discussion about where our work is leading us now in terms of next steps. I know uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and myself are working on the police, for example, so we can comment on that. There are others who are working on community. So I just wanna open that up to see, you know, we can give us, we have a discussion about where we stand with that and where we think our next steps need to go. Oh, I thought we had agreed at our last meeting that we wanted to start hearing from BIPOC folks first. Mm -hmm. And that while we were doing that, we would immediately send questions to the Amherst Police Department that they could be preparing written responses to. So they could be working on that while we're uh, getting to hear from BIPOC folks. Mm -hmm. and. What Mrs. Pat had asked that I do at our last meeting was take the suggestions that everybody made for, you know, what we would put out that we'd like to invite people to talk to us about. Um, so I, in the, in the packet, uh, and when you're ready, I can screen share it if you want. I put together a few questions based on what everybody had contributed. Uh, and my hope is that we could revise those tonight so we could start sharing them with people and schedule some times for people to come talk to us. I, I appreciate that and that's the direction I hope we go tonight um, you know with the, with our discussion. So um, you know if I don't see any objection to that maybe we can go there first. Uh, Jennifer had her yeah, hand Jennifer up. I'm yeah. sorry. I um, 
Russ, is it easier for you to screen share so that you can make the changes live as think, we're going? Is does that yes, work fast? I, I okay. think so. All right, great. Let's see if I can. Thank you. And while while Mr. Vernon Jones is working on, on that, um, again, uh, to the working group and to you know, for those of you who are listening, uh, there's a constant feed into this process by everyone on the uh, working group to come up with questions and uh, we're trying to get a framework for how to approach this um, in the most effective way. So uh, that's just background information. Okay. Can you, can you see this? Yeah. I, it says questions. Yes. I can see it. Yeah. So the first one is about positive and negative experiences. The second one about uh, differential treatment for BIPOC folks and white folks. Um, the third one is uh, one I think Deborah suggested about, do you personally know the names of police officers, which was maybe a measure of how successful community policing is. Um, the fourth one is about trust. The fifth one is their recommendations. And then the last two are, you know, any comments of, with regard to the previous five questions uh, with regard to the fire department or EMTs or the health department? And number seven, is there anything else you wanna share? So that's the sort of overview. Let me scroll back up. We can look at them one at a time and see I mean, people had put in a lot of great things, but wanted me to keep the list short. So <laughs> I tried to tried to do both. Thank you, Russ, for putting this together for us. Um, I still feel that the list is too long. The way I'm thinking in my head. I mean, what is the reason for uh, positive experiences? What do we Probably hope to get from there? I think the positive experience is in, in what what work what is actually working with as far as like community relation with the, with the Amherst Police Department. Um, the one thing I can say just off the bat is that I know that um, Tabor had a really good um, one of the Amherst Police Department um, officers. <clears throat> his basketball coach um, at one point. And so they established, like he was, he, he was the coach of this team. So he established a relationship with the youth that outside of being an officer. Um, so I think those positive things are important because then when we bring that back to Amherst Police Department, they have an understanding of what is, what is possible like let's say you know in part of it we we are saying we want to see them do more community service type things well here you know there's a lot of times where we're struggling to find coaches for for our school schooling events and whatever whatever so you know that's a place where they can you know be involved but not be policing our kids you know like you know rather than having, you know, an officer present at school type thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I think the way I will, okay. okay, so I think, I don't know how the rest of the uh, group feels. Instead of saying positive experiences, why don't we say, what is working? What is, you know, what is working within the APD? And what is not working in addition, like what, to the, in addition to the negative experiences. So, so you have the, the night, what you're saying is have the negative, ex, what are your, what, what I'm saying is, yeah, but then what, what has worked for you in your interactions with Amherst PD? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, what is what, you know, like in general, what is working? from your experience within APD. And then, then people can share their negative experiences. It's just my, my, my opinion. 
Mr. Vernon Jones, I can't see the the whole scroll here, but you know, I know you and I were working on this, but one of the, you know, I don't know, and I don't know where this fits. If it comes later, I'll defer it to the later. But in response to you, Ms. Pat, um, one of the things I was curious about as we were developing these questions is to say, you know, what is the Amherst Police Department doing that they feel is effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm that's okay in our that. that's that in our list of questions for the police department. Yeah, and I will no, say it it this set that. of questions. Uh -huh. I I was not thinking we would ask people to answer all of these. Okay, my uh -huh. thought was we yeah. put these out as here here's the invitation. Okay, talk to us about any of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm fine with that then. Yeah. Because as a black woman, you know, I don't. It's not something that I will respond to. Yeah, you might not. Uh -huh. I would just people won't have a positive say. Mm -hmm. Because if we're, we're talking about police reform, you know, for me, that is an urgency. I want to address what is not working for me as a black mother, as a black parent, as a black right. woman. Yeah. But also for me, Ms. Bowman, yeah. Having, having kids in sports for since they were able to <clears throat> sign up for sports. It's important for, for me to see, to share what's working because I don't want what's working to stop. And that's, and that's what I think is like, uh, that's what concerns me is that if we don't find out what's working, we don't know, we like, it could, they could stop what's working. And, and things like, you know, things like that. And my kids experienced having these interactions with these coaches who happen to be officers as well, you know, for the most part, it has been a situation that has worked. So. Yeah. And so if I may, yeah. if I may and just I, say, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Ferreira, I didn't cut yeah, you off. I mean, I, I just wanted to kind of also echo some of what the Sheen is saying in terms of like, um, yeah, I think it'll be important to kind of hear, you know, what they're doing that, you know, is, is helpful within the community. Um, because then we can kind of build upon um, some of those things if there are some, right? If the community shares that there's some things that they're doing that's positive, that is helpful, um, it will be good for us to hear because then we can either, you know, continue with those or improve upon those, especially if it's around any type of community uh, policing type of work that they're doing. Um, and me right now, I don't know that, you know? So I think as opposed to just hearing just what's the negatives and everything, because of course we want to hear the negatives, but what's the positives that, you know, hopefully we can do more with. And also, I mean, I like the fact that we have, um, you know, these different questions because, you know, again, yeah, people don't have to, to answer all of them, but it, it, it gives enough so that they're able to, uh, maybe it'll spur them to think about, oh, wait a minute, yeah, you know, maybe I do know someone personally, you know, a police officer, and I want to share this story, or I want to talk about, you know, this negative interaction, or whatever, you know, it kind of is, is enough of a, of a smorgasbord that can, can and, but not too much, that it can spur them sharing some information. I guess what I'm struggling with is just the positioning of the question. I mean, it, it seems like the first number. I'm sorry, say that again, please. It's, it's, I guess what I'm struggling with is the is where the question is. It's like number one. I don't think that matters though. Yeah, what experience is positive or negative? But we but can I, move on. We can move on. It's fine. I, I think what Russ was saying though is that. It doesn't matter what the position of the question is. It's just like, it's kind of like talking points. Like, like when I looked at it, I didn't like, and I was thinking of like people that I wanted to speak to and get their stories. I wasn't looking at it as like, ask this question, ask this question. I was looking at it as like things to think about and try to like, you know, use my own words to bring out this information from that person. So I think, it, I think he was saying to use it as just a guide. But I mean, for me though, uh, Ms. Pat, I mean, I don't mind us switching it around. I see what you're saying too. I, I, mean, I know I know my network, what they're talking. We have to be careful that we don't insult people because we're talking about police reform and then, you know, people are anxious to see changes. 
Are there good things happening in police department? Absolutely. But, the, you know, we're here to, you know, to, to make some recommendation for reform. We just have to be careful that we don't insult people when we invite them to, you know, share their experiences. I know what people are, you know, are telling me, what people are talking to me about. So do you have any recommendations? Do you have any suggestions, Ms. Pat, in terms of like how we could reorder it? No, basically what I'm saying is, is that, that, you know, we can at some point like below say, you know, you know what is working in APD department or something like that. But I don't think it should be, you know, the first question mm -hmm. that we list. Yeah. Yeah. Would it, if we're moving would it around, I'm okay. But yeah. You know, positive experiences. I know if, if people ask me that, I'm not, I'm just I'm just going to skip it. Mm -hmm. Because my focus is we want to reform the department. Would it be more inviting to some of the people we want to really have talked to us if we just made us what experiences negative or positive have you had? Perhaps. Yeah, and I mean, I think maybe switch it around and put some of the other ones that are kind of deal more with the BIPOC, like number two and everything, maybe that could be number one. And then we can kind of, you know, what do you believe it'll take to build the trust could be number two, you know, what, what change would you like to, to see or recommend could be number three, and then we could talk about experiences as number four or something like that, you know? I think one of the things that, um, uh, you know, Mr. Vernon Jones is trying to 